So next up is Mark Morano. He's the Executive Director and Chief Correspondent of ClimateDepot.com and Communications Director at CFACT. He previously served as a senior advisor, speechwriter, and climate researcher for one of my favorites, U.S. Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma, and comms director for the Senate EPW Committee. Uh, his work is well known. He has appearances on CNN, The O'Reilly Factor, BBC TV, New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, Wall Street Journal. He's the winner of the Accuracy in Media Journalism Award and was inducted into the Town Hall of Fame. Welcome, Mr. Morano. Thank you very much. I have a lot to cover here. We're going to go from uh, uh, America, D.C., and Paris, ultimately, and talk a little bit about the basic premise is, can the weather be controlled? And what, what is happening in Washington? What kind of claims are we hearing? First off, December 7th, a day that will live in infamy. Well, a new day that will live in infamy. The global warming uh, movie, Climate Hustle, will premiere at a Paris theater. I just got word this morning that we are actually overbooked for the December 7th red carpet movie event. We are, we are hundreds of, of people capacity and the theater is now completely uh, overbooked. So we have to actually have limited standing room only for this premiere. The film will reveal which animal was used as a mascot for global cooling in the 1970s and the same animal used as a mascot for global warming in the, in, in the, in the current day. Uh, in other words, when it was cooling, the animal migrated south to get warmth, and when it was warming, the anim animal's now migrating north to get cool. Uh, and they're basically, both claims were made with a straight face of this animal. Who am I? As James Stockdale said, someone mentioned him yesterday, Ross Pro's running mate. Uh, I am a, well, I won't say that, but that was a ClimateGate professor in a BBC Live interview who, uh, you know, that was probably a more polite word than denier. I was in the film Merchants of Doubt. Don't confuse this with Climate Hustle. Climate Hustle is the film uh, that I'm in. This is a movie that I was interviewed for. It's a global warming activist film done by the people who did Al Gore's film, Participant Media. And I was attacked. And here are some of the reviews from that. I was portrayed as the villain. And these are quotes from, these are from the LA Times, New York, uh, New York Post. Terrifyingly impressive, sadistic, magnificent er uh, anti-hero. The Washington Post, the star of the film, a jocular, weirdly unapologetic advocate for what can only be called ignorance, meaning a skeptic. I'm not a scientist, but I, I, but I play one on TV. That was the line that the movie used in the trailer. They called me sick, scary, loathsome mercenary, evil nemesis, a grinning skull nihilist. That was my favorite one. So, and all I did was talk about being a global warming skeptic. So here we were talking, I think it was uh, Walt Cunningham was talking about the public and how we're, we're not getting through. I, and, and it depends on which polls you look at, how the question's asked. But I consider Gallup being the gold standard. They don't have an agenda when it comes to this. And the way to look at this is not whether people believe in global warming or whether they, you know, whether they accept or reject. It's whether they're afraid of it. Because uh, as Richard Lindzen was pointing out yesterday, you know, whether people have, man has an influence or not, how big it is, it's all a matter of scale. 2015, Gallup Global Warming didn't even make the list for the top issues facing the country. And now in previous years, it usually came in at number 14, number 15. This year didn't even make the list. Gallup also found global warming at its lowest level of concern. And that is the key thing. There are people worried about it, they concerned. Since 1989, it's the same level of concern as before the UN panel, as before all the Nobel, the, the, the Nobel Prize winning reports, before Al Gore's film. In the 1980s, no one was even thinking about global warming. The Amazon rainforest was the big issue. We're at the same level of concern. Most shockingly, Gallup found, and this again, last March, global warming ranks at the bottom of environmental concerns. And that's the shocking stat. If you look at it there, pollution of uh, drinking water, forest uh, extinction, uh, deforestation, all rank higher than global warming. It's the dead last among environmental issues. We've won an important battle there. And I get to the end, I'll tell you how, what's sad about this is we may be losing the political battle because of President Obama's willingness to bypass Congress. Let's just talk about a little of the shenanigans. Right now we had Lamar Smith here this morning talking about the, the pause busting study. What pause? That's a book about the commissar vanishes under Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union. When commissars were in, out of favor with the Soviet leadership, they would be airbrushed out of photos. And that's essentially the same level of what we're finding out here, not just on the global warming pause. This was a pause that they've tried to, first of all, denied existed. And then about five years ago, the UN chief admitted that it existed. And then 
they also, at the previous times, they tried to get rid of the medieval warm period as well. And there's the actual pause, 18 years, nine months. This is the latest data just posted about two weeks ago on Climate Depot. Uh, this was from the RSS satellite feed. This is the longest record. It's a record expansion of the global warming pause. So they denied it, they admitted it, and my favorite, uh, one sec here, is this. In the UK government, a UK energy minister actually took credit for, for uh, uh, climate policies, green policies, for causing the global warming pause. So at one point they stopped denying it and they were saying, hey, look, it's working. All these climate regulations we're doing, it's working. We're slowing down the Earth's temperature. And they actually said, you know, warming may have decreased, which, su which support the effectiveness of green policies. Now, they have 66 excuses for the global warming pause. This is before they got rid of it. What's interesting about that is in 1974, there were literally 60 theories had been advanced to explain the global cooling period. So we had global cooling, and by the way, global cooling was the same metric. They, it, it obviously existed, it had showed up in National Academy of Science and NASA, it showed up in CIA reports, showed up by top scientists at the time. Now new studies are claiming the global warming claims never existed, that that was all a myth. We had 60 theories to explain it, they say now it doesn't exist. We have 66 theories to explain the global warming pause. Now, they say that doesn't exist. And of course, what are they smoking when they claim that green policies do that? Okay, does the global warming science even matter? I'm heading off to Paris in a few weeks. The EU climate commissioner on record as saying, even if we're wrong on science, we're doing the right thing by policy. And that basically sums up this whole movement. They don't really care whether we're facing catastrophe. They care that they can motivate politics to support their policies. If the science some decades says we were wrong, why would, would it not in any case have been good to do many of the things we're doing, which is essentially planning an energy economy? What is it all about? If it's not about science, what is it? UN uh, Vice Chair uh, Edenhofer, Otto von Edenhofer, actually said in 2000, we will redistribute the world's wealth by climate policy. Now, is Bob Murray in the room by any chance? Because he, he's not, but he predicted, he said, obviously the owners of coal and oil will not be enthusiastic about this. I was gonna ask Bob if he was enthusiastic about it. But this is what it's about. They had to free themselves from the illusion that climate policy is environmental policy. This isn't a skeptic saying it. These are the people implementing the policy at the UN IPCC, admitting that climate policy has nothing to do with the environment, that it's about wealth redistribution. Another agenda. What kind of claims are we hearing? In Washington, we're hearing about poisoned weather. What in the world's poisoned weather? A tornado. Oh my gosh, Houston had a flood. That's fossil fueled poisoned weather. This is what, according to uh, Brad Johnson, a global warming activist. Oh, wrong button. This is the new phrase coming out of Washington. Not just extreme weather, poisoned weather. Global warming now is even impacting the dead, according to our mainstream media. Siger Siberian corpses are could ooze contagious viruses as their graves thaw out. That's not all. We may need UN treaties and carbon taxes to save the mummy. Climate change causing mummies to turn to black ooze. The, the burial sites have higher humidity due to climate change. So not only are we affecting your children, future generations, you're affecting past generations unless we deal with this. And, and it, it's actually a racial issue. Bill McKibben, we've all heard of him. White America has fallen short by voting for climate deniers. Paul K uh, Krugman, New York Times columnist, burn in hell. Those who deny global warming, quote, this is quote on the pages of the New York Times, not in an off the cuff speech or a radio interview. He said this in the pages of the New York Times. May you be punished in the afterlife for doing so, denying global warming. He called denial, quote, an almost inconceivable sin, unquote. So you're harming the dead, you're harming future generations, you're, uh, um, if you're white, you've fallen short by voting for deniers, and you're, uh, you're going to be punished in the afterlife for your views. What are some of the signs? In 1933, we're talking about poison weather, the, the government in Syria banned yo-yos because they thought it caused drought. Now they want to ban SUVs, coal plants, because they think it causes droughts, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, etc. Peace professor Michael Clare, this is Hampshire College. This is how apocalyptic they've come. Let me see if I can get all this. This is one actual quote that he wrote in Salon Magazine, a mainstream publication. This is some of the fantasies of doomsday. Quote, we envision, <coughs> we envision rising temperatures, prolonged droughts, freakish storms, hellish wildfires, rising sea levels, food rights, mass starvation, state collapse, mass migrations, conflicts of every sort up to and including full-scale war, could prove even more disruptive, deadly, persistent drought, hunger forced millions of people to abandon their traditional lands and flee to the squalor of shanty towns. 
That is what people are being taught by peace professors at college. Nancy Pelosi, our, our former uh, House Speaker, declared, every aspect of our lives must be subjected to an inventory in order to combat global warming. New York Times' Tom Friedman lauded China. One party rule can just impose politically difficult but critically important policies to move society forward. To hell with democracy. NASA's, I call him NASA's ex-con, the former lead scientist to global warming because he's been arrested about half a dozen times protesting Keystone Pipeline because of the global warming alleged impacts. He endorsed a book, and you can still find this on Amazon.com, the review, called for ridding the world of industrial civilization. Uh, NASA's lead global warming scientist declared the author had it right, the system is the problem. The book that NASA's lead global warming scientist endorsed proposed raising cities to the ground, blowing up dams, and switching off the greenhouse gas machine. Hmm, scientists aren't just neutral observers, are they? And that's what Einstein thought. <laughs> hey, if we can affect the dead, we can bring back the dead to comment on uh, James Hansen. UN climate chiefs wants a centralized transformation taking place. And she said it's going to be a, a make life on the planet different for everyone. Now, does that sound exciting? China's doing the right thing. They, you know, not only the New York Times, hey, the UN's got to get on it. They've lauded China's one-party rule. This is the UN chief. China is able to implement policies because they avoid the legislative hurdles. Jeez, don't you hate legislative hurdles when you want to get something done? Uh, shrink humans. You don't like it. You're going, to the, you're going to hell. You're already condemned to the afterlife, according to the New York Times. Well, how about human engineering? This he's featured in Climate Hustle. Genetically engineering humans with, with drugs to increase your altruism, shrink your height to reduce your um, carbon footprint. This is not made up. We have the video of this guy going on and on in the film. The UN Climate Summit, it's not actually a climate summit, it's a peace summit. New Yorker just this week, actually two days ago, why a climate deal is the best hope for peace. Global warming, now they're trying to say global warming caused terrorism, caused the rise of ISIS because of the drought in Syria, despite the fact that droughts aren't increasing. In 19, global warming caused terrorism before, but before that, global cooling caused terrorism. And there's the article, this is via real website. The CIA warned that it was bringing drought, famine, and political unrest if the global cooling continued. Carbon-based energy is the moral choice. It's one of the greatest liberators of mankind in the history of our planet. It's always Earth Hour in North Korea. That's South Korea on the bottom. We're all North Koreans now. We're heading that way at this UN treaty. The era of constant electricity at home is ending, the UK power chief has, war has warned. Families would have to get used to using power only when it was available. There's the article. This is incredible. They're now telling, de not the developed, developing world, but the developed world is regressing to the point where we just can't. You want to use your washing machine? Not, sorry, not between the hours of 10 and 4. You've got to use it non-peak. It's unbelievable this is where we're heading because of these fears. John Holdren, Obama's science advisor, revealed the real energy agenda. 1975, the real threat is cheap energy. Quote, the U.S. is threatened far more by the hazards of too much energy too soon than by the hazards of too little energy too late. They told us what they were up to years ago. Recession is planned. Uh, I interviewed this man at a UN climate summit. He's a big global warming scientist. He shows up. He's part of the UN. He advocates planned recessions. He's personally cut back on daily. He doesn't shower daily. He doesn't change his clothes. He's in my film as well. He tells the UN uh, climate we have to give up our obsession of economic growth. Uh, warmest Professor Alice Larkin Bowles. She just spoke at the TED conference sponsored by Bill Gates. Economic growth needs to be exchanged for, quote, planned austerity. And they're calling, again, planned recessions. It's called degrowth strategies. Vaclav Klaus said it best. He lived under communism. The, this ideology wants to replace free and spontaneous evolution of mankind by essential planning, global planning. He's, he's warned about it. So with that, we have the EPA regulations coming. Uh, and, I, and I'd be happy to talk in Q&A about where the Republicans are failing and how this has to be done. But if we did face a crisis and we had to rely on the EPA and UN, we would all be doomed uh, because nothing they propose would have any impact on the climate that you could measure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morano. Thanks. Um, I have uh, been on panels with self-proclaimed socialists. I've been on panels with anarcho-capitalists. And Mark, this is the first panel I've been on with a grinning skull nihilist. So um, I, I feel like I've uh, accomplished something already. Between your panel and, last, and, and yesterday as well, um, 
energy prices go way up, energy availability, reliability, including potentially brownouts, blackouts, et cetera, and the, the reliability goes down, all to address a problem that doesn't even exist. Um, Mr. Gifford, when you were asking if, if about, or you're commenting about people being depressed, um, now I can assure you, I'm, as you might be able to tell, I'm not depressed, I'm enraged. And what I'm wondering is where are the checks and balances, and specifically we have a Republican-controlled Congress. What should they be doing about this right now to just cut this whole thing off at the knees and say no? This is not going to happen. It is just not acceptable, period. Uh, well, one thing I might tell you is that so it's pending. A lot. Republicans really have to make this a issue in the campaign. I was, uh, when you hear Donald Trump or other candidates just say, oh, you know, global, at one time Donald Trump was asked about it at a rally, and he said, who here cares about global warming? I Let's move on, next question. Well, whether you believe in it, not believe in it, you still have to address the fact that President Obama has bypassed Congress. In part of my presentation, I mentioned the polling data. Well, beyond that, politically, we won the battle of global warming. Cap and trade failed in 2003, 2005, 2007, 2009, 10. It was never even put in for a vote in the final vote in the Senate. Uh, we never had carbon taxes. We never ratified UN treaties. So politically, we were able to stop it all. The problem is, and this is where President Obama is more, I guess, powerful than LBJ. He's gone to, he's now at the level of FDR in terms of transforming America. By bypassing Congress, doing the EPA executive orders, and they're not executive action, because that makes him sound like a man of action. These are orders, executive order. These EPA regs essentially are going to put de facto climate regulations that the American people in Congress has repeatedly reject, rejected. Now, if the next president, if the lawsuits fail and the next president is, is, continues this policy, we're looking at four, eight more years with these in place. It's kind of like, you know, Obamacare, where they tried to repeal it. Well, you know, now that's probably part. When, once government expands and central planning goes, it's very hard to ever roll it back. So you ask what they should do. They need to seriously talk about defunding the EPA. They need to seriously make this a, <coughs> a tier one issue where the whole election is going to be about this. price and reliability. This microphone's not working. I was part of those delegations every year going to these UN summits during the Bush administration and they were, you know, the Bush administration played all along and legitimized, funded the UN science at the same time, you know, a lot of people said, oh, you know, George W. Bush is, is not pursuing this. Well, he, he set the stage for Obama and now, well, now we're facing a UN agreement without Senate ratification. So we're having domestic climate legislation bypassed, international climate legislation bypassed, and all despite the fact the public is with the skeptics and we've won all these battles politically. It's just he's transforming America. He truly is. He's not an incompetent president. He knows what he's doing. Do you see anything uh, uh, different from or more draconian than this EPA uh, clean power plan coming out of um, Paris and whatever is anticipated to come out of that? Well, Paris is probably, you know, even John Kerry, they're saying it's not going to be binding. It's probably going to be a lot of voluntary stuff. The problem with that is even though it's not, even if it's not compelled upon the U.S. with sanctions or anything, it's going to be a policy that the president, which makes the next election crucial, because if the next president supports the framework or whatever agreement that comes out of Paris, we're going to continue that through EPA and through other regulations to, to adhere to that, to do everything we can to continue to cripple our energy economy. And that's the whole problem. And just the point of that other thing, the reason Republicans especially are extra weak when it comes to environment and climate, if you go back to every president, Republican president since Richard Nixon, the most liberal, progressive, centrally planning minded a member of their cabinets have always been the EPA administrator. We know that because every former EPA administrator, Democrat, Republican, has endorsed President Obama's EPA climate rule. Republicans tend to think we don't want to deal with this the environment issue. You know, I've got all these other priorities. I'll toss a bone to the other side. They usually get an establishment to progressive figure to run the EPA, and that's usually where all the havoc comes. And they don't want to deal with it. And I was on the Senate 
When I worked in the Senate, we had major Republican senators whose staff would stand up in meetings when we were doing, debating, ca talking about cap and trade and say, we don't, wanna, we don't want the senator um, talking about the science. We don't want to look like we're against the environment. We have to be very careful. We only want to talk about jobs. And so they're just timid and afraid. They're intimidated. And that's the whole problem, especially on the environment. They just, they're, they're not educated enough and they don't want to stand up on it.